Um, what was it like to be followed around by the film crew? A bit invasive at first. It took some getting used to, but my interest as an artist was peaked. Uh, and then I had to even um, let go a lot of that process. But in a lot of ways, it was very much an apprenticeship in certain aspects and in others. Uh, initially, it was uh, very much invasive. And then when it had to really get personal, um, a lot more than I thought I bargained for, you know, and eventually I got used to it. Thankfully, I was um, very close friends with my working crew. It was just a few of us. So um, they became friends with my family and, and we all like would spend a lot of time together outside of filming. So that helped. And um, again, on a little bit of a lighter note, um, toward the end of the movie, you mentioned something that maybe will elicited this question. Um, what's been the, the most enjoyable part of uh, this, whatever this is referencing? <laughs> Your story is quite large, but what's been one of the, the, uh, the funnest uh, parts about this? I say, I say like being able to stand in front of the ma masterpiece paintings of the world. It's like porn for me, if I'm being honest. Like th that stuff is, I'm like a, a kid in the candy store when I'm able to go to just about any museum in our country, because it's always something there, but um, especially some of the, the museums in Europe and um, being able to really go study and use this as an opportunity to, uh, to learn, which honestly learning is just fun to me. I've always liked learning. Love that. Uh, well, I'm gonna give the driver's seat back to uh, Sadie here. <laughs> Thanks, I love that. Kid in the candy store. <laughs> That's a great image. I love it. Um, if anyone else has a question. Yeah, 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 please. We have one more from an in-person audience member. <laughs> Is it unmuted? Hi, George. Um, Hi. My name is Quinn and you're funny. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing your story. Um, some like some of the thoughts I had was like, what a heavy burden that you bear to navigate, to be one of the first to navigate the world of fine art in the way that you do, like speaking about the Eurocentricity of it all. So also, you know, thank you for that. But um, my question for you was like, I noticed that you love education. And so I'm like, are there any other subjects or philosophies besides art that um, you've studied or you have an interest in, um, whether or not they influence your art? But I'm very curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, um, that's a good question, especially to say whether or not they interest the art. Everything seems to be connected in some way, and I, I, I do see that connection, but um, yeah, I love the idea of philosophy. I love the idea of theology. I love the idea of metaphysics. I love the idea of um, history and um, just religion in general. I like, I like religion, even though I'm non-religious, if that makes sense. Just like kind of the intent of it. Um, the goal of it, maybe, I'd say. Um, but art definitely has been more of my religion these days. But I like, I like, I like, I kind of like that. If I weren't doing this, I, I'd somehow be involved with some, like on some religious level. I love music as well, um, writing. I could see myself writing, but I, I love a lot of, honestly, I love a lot of the, like, metaphysical mumbo jumbo stuff. So it'd probably be something really woo woo. Like, you know, I, I you should see my bookshelf, it's crazy. Um, and that, yeah, I'd probably be in, in one of those realms dealing, you know, maybe, you know, I do archeological digs in Egypt, you know, so I'd probably be an anthropologist, you know, into that 
kind of thing, um, research, stuff like that. Awesome. Um, yeah, good luck. You will be in the museums forever remembered with Rembrandt. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we have one more question from uh, an online audience member. Go ahead. Um, I'm seeing Nani. A little bit now, a little bit now. We're struggling to hear you, but if you'd like to ask your question in the chat, we could also do it like that if that's easier. I have a quick question. Sure, go ahead. And then as soon as we get that other one in the chat, let's go ahead. Oh, we see it here. Okay, I'll... We'll come right back to you. Uh, the question in the chat says, Hi, Daniel. Hi, George. My name is Nayani, and if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, please let me know. I'm a researcher trying to study arts and prisons in California and India. Being located in Calcutta, India, I could not watch your documentary, but would really like not missing out on it. In the recent future, is there any way that it can be aired online internationally? Um, I'm not sure if you're able to access it on HBO, but it is currently streaming. Um, and I guess, Daniel, that might be a question for you. Are there any plans to move this impact campaign to an international scope? And if it already is uh, being received internationally, sort of who's on the other end of that? It's a good question. I hope, uh, Nayani, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, I hope that you're able to see it on HBO. As far as the impact campaign, unfortunately, the US prison system is the worst in the entire world, and so our focus continues to be the U.S. prison system, but um, I hope that through HBO you're able to, to see uh, the documentary because it's incredible, it's award-winning, and it's incredibly heartfelt. So I'm not sure if you're able to, you know, I'm, I'm not part of the film team in terms of the rights for the film, but um, hopefully through HBO you'll be able to watch it. And if you're not, I apologize, and I hope it becomes available more broadly in the near future. It's something I can also check in on for you, and I can email you when I have an answer for you. Um, uh, Paul, I think you were about to say something. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Sadie. Um, first of all, uh, I just want to say that that movie was incredibly powerful, um, and uh, the the poise and wisdom. Uh, that you're sharing and it I, I i think is going to resonate deeply with anybody who who you know spends the time to watch that movie um and i guess one question i had is it's 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 a little difficult probably to answer but i, I wonder you mentioned at some point that uh you know having been sentenced to 11 years and or whatever chunk of time it was an enormous period of time in prison um, you took that sort of as a basis for determination to, you know, prove what you were and to, you know, become what you've become. And I, and I guess I wonder, do you ever speculate in your mind about what would have become of you had you grown up in a, you know, sort of more privileged, sane environment um, and, and how that, where you would be today? Um, you know, I see that you came into prison with talent because you were, you know, early on saying that you would put up a painting and that sort of, you know, I guess was currency right, right off the bat. Um, but I wonder, um, I guess that's sort of a twofold question about where you think you might have, like, if you even do. Um, and, uh, and then also maybe who, who some of the people were that maybe were contributing to your, you know, a recognition of talent before you got there and before you were accepted by sort of the establishment and schools and, and studying with, you know, the Ivy League types? Great questions. Wow. Yeah. I'd say 
um, I, I do speculate in my mind about that. And I found myself in spaces that almost um, forced me to ask myself those questions because it's a totally different space today that I'm in and the people I'm around, you know, in these sketch groups, you know, and the artists and the, the, the wine and cheese crowd and it's a different side of the tracks. And these questions do arise. Um, I, I work with privileged kids even and their parents talk to me about like, you know, it's like, if I could just get through to them, can you talk to them? And, you know, these things, you know, I, I have just come to face these questions in my own mind. One of the things that has given me some level of clarity around an answer, which is a good question and it's a hard one. Um, but in psychology, the world of um, psychology and Jungian anal uh, analytics or ana analysis, Jungian analysis, I'm sorry. Um, uh, there's this idea of us all having the shadow component to ourselves. Um, and that the person who has been through a massive amount, like Khalil Gibran said, like the most massive characters are seared with scars, right? This idea in, in the Jungian worldview or the view of psychology that you're only half a person if you haven't accessed those parts of yourself, those shadowy parts of yourself that someone who has maybe been through a lot and can can overcome it, process it, and 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 mine it for jewels or a treasure and see the value in it, see it as this this um this this gift, if you will. And and because of that, somehow turn it into that, I I, I kind of started to adopt this view that that people that that have such a, a you know lived experience you know maybe a degree of suffering and challenges um, have a potential for a more in, deeper character a, 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 a capacity to uh, know more to grow know themselves more to, to deal with life circumstances see things differently than others and it could actually, extract uh, the whatever sublime qualities you may have in you if you could become aware of those things. And so in that sense, I think there's tremendous value to not being privileged. It's this idea of grit by Michelle Duckworth. She wrote a book called Grit. And um, my privileged friend, Natalie, whose son is apprentice with me and my nephew, Treshawn, who's in the film, He's, he's they're, they're here with me for the summer or he's coming home for the summer. He goes to boarding school, super privileged kid, like great kid too. And she tries to get him to read the book Grit, but you can read books about it. It's just something that about like having to face certain challenges that I think that if you can um, overcome them, it's maybe a coping mechanism. I get it. I, I, I think I understand your question. You know, like somehow I trick myself into believing this and that I could do it with the hardest career path as a struggling artist, right? But, and it's hard. I'm not going to say it isn't, but somehow I find that like it's my, my struggles that gave me this um, like depth of character and the way that I see the world. And I, that emotion, that pain has a way of coming out in the work in a way that's a gift to me. And maybe it's because I saw it that way. I was crazy enough to see it that way. But I do believe that in, in this idea that if we all can access those unconscious shadow parts of ourselves, you never know how much more of a fuller person we all could be. That could apply to anyone. Thanks. I hope that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's a it's a beautiful answer and it and it rings true. Um 
We have time for a couple last questions. We have um, a couple more from our in-person audience here. Hello, good evening. Um, thank you, George, uh, for your, your work. I know um, people don't plan on being a hero, you know, when you, you hear the stories of heroes, it's not something that they anticipated, they planned. Um, some people say it's the, being at the right place at the right time, you know, but your story of, of, of pain and suffering, uh, you became that, that candidate, you know, so just hearing your journey is, is a very heroic, heroic, you know, in, in, in what you're doing. And just uh, appreciate that. And in the and in the area of the family dynamics, George, I I, I know you you have probably a lot of directions that you're going in, but uh, in the future, if you happen to do anything in regards to um, closure, as far as with uh, uh, parents that have been involved in in, in drug use, you know, uh, what I'm trying to say is I got mommy issues and daddy issues. You know what I mean? So um, because of of choices that my parents made. And um, it just seems like you have that heart that uh, the main part of the question is that, have you found any closure in, in the way that you were raised, the people that guided you the, the or didn't guide you, the people that were there as, as uh, the nurturers in your family? Um, whatever those feelings or emotions are, did, have you been able to find a way to get closure in that area? Because that's kind of been my journey. Uh, mother and father, you know, father overdosed of heroin when I was young and, and mother involved in drugs. And um, I have children, I'm a grandfather, but uh, I just, I lack because I, I still am on, on that journey for, for closure in my life. And just any kind of aspect that you can give in, in regards to that area of closure of, of having a parent that maybe should have been a certain way, but wasn't exactly that parent that uh, you might be able to share a, any kind of closure uh, advice or recommendations. Thank you, sir. Wow. I'm, yeah, I'm honored that you would ask me. Um, I'm so clearly and evidently struggling with the whole process in the film. And so it's, it's a day to day and I, I could just maybe share a bit about how I'm, I'm handling it in real time. So my, my mother, who is in the film pretty prominently. And I would say what I've identified as source material around who I became, how I became to be who I am. And I, she's since moved with me, moved here to Atlanta with me. Um, did you see the film yet? Yes. Yes, you did mention that, sorry. Um, I, um, she's been in therapy with me. She's, she's like actually doing better than me now. And in the film, you can maybe see her um, um, struggling with just barely able to speak. And um, now she is a re-entry specialist and she's speaking, she's been on the news. She's currently living in Atlanta. She has her own place and, you know, just traveling and working doing the very thing that I struggled with her all my life with, which was being in and out of prison. And right now, because I made the radical decision to um, somehow move her to Atlanta from Kansas City, extract her from that neighborhood or that, that community and, and, and bet on her healing, my healing through her healing, what I, is what I'm getting at. I think I, I may have like did something. It was a it was a big risk. Everybody that loved me and cared for me said, "Do not, you know, do that." Like she she's dangerous to herself. She she can't help, you know. But to, um, you can see my girlfriend of, at the time in the film telling me not to. Um, and I I swear it's the best decision I ever made. And in a, in a way, I think um, it by going straight to the source of it, it in helping her, it indirect, indirectly helped me with my own um, way that I relate to the world, to other people, because I will find 
that in my relationships with, not even just women, you know, I will project things. I will have certain complexes, certain triggers, like the things that I think you're, you're referencing when it's like, you know, how do I shake that? The, the, the residuals of that, you know, the mommy issues, the daddy issues that, that are a topic today. Um, I went head first in it. I, I sacrificed my relationships for it, um, chose to, um, and that's why my daughter figures so prominently into it as well. Like she became this opportunity to reparent myself, um, to, to get it right. And, and just trying to raise her right. I'm raising that part of me that was never raised. And, and by helping my mom, I'm really going into the deepest, most esoteric symbolic meaning of the, the dark side. Um, you know, did you, if you see, you know, the, 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 there's a reference to Joseph, the story of Joseph, if, if you know the Bible, um, in the film, like subtly placed in a key moment, you know, like very quick and brief. It's a lot of subtlety. You know, going to Africa recently helped me reconcile um, inner Africa, West Africa, helped me reconcile the feelings of betrayal that can be felt on the most microcosmic level and macro one. Um, going there and seeing it myself in a way, not, not like, you know, there's a, just a lot that is sim symbolic in my mother's story that has to do with the, the story of history even. And a lot of the anger that I would carry around that is being healed by going into that part of myself as well. And so it's also a metaphor as that, um, but, but I would say definitely um, if I couldn't have had the opportunity to get clo this close to my mom, she literally lives minutes from me. She works minutes from me. We, we go to, I was gonna show you this picture this is her on the same therapist couch as you see me mm. on in the film. In the film, <laughs> you remember you remember the Ghanaian mud cloth behind me and the lamp back there. This is a painting I'm doing of her on that same mm. therapy couch. So, there, it, it, this is it, I'm not saying the journey's been easy. Like she still has a lot of the same tendencies. It's it's like, but it's so sincere. She's really changing, um, and, and through her healing somehow I find that I'm healing and the way that I, I approach other people is different now not and not just my relationships just the expectations I have of others the things I will project on the other people um the little boy in me being crushed and feeling rejected at the least slightest thing you know I see where it comes from now and so there's like this opportunity to look at the thing but if I didn't have that um, maybe there will be people in your life that will be so generous that could just like let you project that onto them. It's like psychologically, it works. Like if you just had like a person that could be that, could kind because of, like maybe you can't replace it. Maybe you got to find a way to kind of reconcile with the fact that they're not there and get over it. But maybe somebody else that you can you know relate to in that way and who don't don't mind. I notice my therapist don't mind acting like my dad at times. And I think he does that on purpose because he knows like my, you know, my, I don't have my dad super present and it works, it works. Um, but going, I had to just go right into the thing where most people run from, it, literally. Mm -hmm. I, I dove head first into it. Thank, thank you, George. It takes a lot of courage. Appreciate your help. Thank you. Man, I, I so appreciate um, everyone's vulnerability and being real about what it takes to get through this because it's yeah. it's beautiful to come out on the other side of it, but it's it's just really hard when you're in the middle of it. So I I really appreciate um, and applaud your 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 bravery and your candor and sharing that with us. Um, we have one last question here, and then I'd love to wrap things up because I know things are running late. Um, and again, we really appreciate your time with us here tonight, especially as I know that, you know, you two are on the East Coast and probably are super ready for an eight hour long nap right now. Um, so I'll wrap things up here. Hello. Um, I, I have um, a question about uh, the art itself. And thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, 
to experience the story. My familiarity with your art is is pretty much exclusively through the film. Um, and one thing I noticed, you know, it's it very much in this the classical style. Um, and the backgrounds tend to be very abstracted, like a, a Rembrandt, you know, it's, it's, uh, tends to be. And I was wondering, if, in terms of your aesthetic interests, um, if you had any interest in reflecting uh, the specificity of, of some of the environments that we saw in the film. I think one of the things I thought the film did a really good job of was capturing uh, the environment with a great deal of specificity, and it felt like uh, a strong character in the film, you know, rather than like putting you in these abstract places when you're talking, you know, you see it, it can be on a shabby lazy boy, uh, but there's still Rembrandt lighting in the scene. And I noticed um, there were a number of shots that that very powerfully seemed to capture um, that, that environment. And I was wondering if you have any aesthetic interest in reflecting that in, in your work, because it seems like it's a very important part of uh of what uh is there or if you're more interested in making the portrait seem just timeless or out of time great question no i i, I see it all as a portrait of me or the person whether their physical body is maybe in the composition or not an empty lazy boy is suggestive of that per the personality the character and it's very much a portrait of the person, the tradition that I, I study in, and I've, I've only had the great fortune to maybe just kind of study, make studies and like play around. I haven't even gotten started as much. And, and it's been classified as art already. And that's like really a privilege, honestly. But um, no, I, like in terms of my aspiration, it just has to do with the visible world, the whole visible world. And, and, Yes, it can be a portrait of many things just told, you know, like the crumple, a crumpling leaf could tell the story of life and death, in my, in my opinion. So metaphorically speaking, I can, yeah, paint an interior scene, which I'm working on of my own studio. And you don't see my, my face, my likeness, but it's very much a portrait of me, for example, or like the, the spaces, that was very intentional. So yeah, I, I would say that the whole entire visible world, whether it be interior scenes, exterior scenes, um, landscape, still lives, um, portrait figure, these are the big genres for me in the tradition that, that I'm a part of as a, as a painter of the natural world. One of the, one of the things I think is really interesting about you know, becoming, entering into a tradition of art is that you are obviously in conversation with artists who've come before. And it's this kind of, it's the, the, the dynamic of that conversation is, is strange because you get to take from what they've done and be influenced by it. Uh, they don't really get to talk back in a way, but, but they get to be first movers and first influencers. Um, in terms of being in conversation with that tradition of art, um, do, you, do you think much about how your, what, what you are contributing uh, would be received by, uh, by the artists who've come before who, who you know, are long dead? Sometimes, yeah, I, I, I even, in my mind, sometimes believe that they're like standing right behind me, like I envision it when I work. So very much so. If I mean, I, I feel it at times, I don't know if I'm, you know, tricking myself, but I definitely envision it like as a tactic. Like I, I kind of like use that as like a, a visionary tool sometimes. Thank you. I appreciate that I, in the same way that, you know, um, you and all of the rest of us artists out here are standing on the shoulders of giants. So are all of the men and women that are getting out of, um, that are getting out of prison and that are looking to you and your work as a real inspiration and as a source of strength and, and light. So I thank you both so much for all that you've gifted us today and for sharing the space and time and for everyone who is able to make it out here tonight as well. 
we're so, so, so deeply grateful for both of you and for everyone in this room and in this little <laughs> square room as well. Thank all of you. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed the conversation and um, keep following George. He's going to do amazing things that will uh, outlive the best of us. So thanks for your time today. Thank you. Yeah, please stay tuned to represent justice and master of life. Okay. Thanks, Sadie. Thank you, George. Thank, Thank you. you. Daniel. Thanks, y'all. Bye.